Welcome back to part two of Fit to Compete with the author of that brilliant book, Michael Beer. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. I, I'm looking forward to this conversation, this second conversation, which I believe we said would be about the strategic fitness process and how honest conversations can be held. This show is going to be very visual. So for people who are listening to us, we'll do our best to describe for you, but you're better off having a look at the YouTube channel where you'll be able to see those slides that Mike has kindly shared and he will take us through today because this will be about the framework. But Mike, I, I had something for you first. I was running a workshop yesterday in London and at the end of the workshop, a lady asked a very, very important question. She said, how do you get a company to invest in the future, even though the leaders of the organizations are not going to be there? And she said, have you got any good examples of that? Yeah. And I was like, going, there are, but none of them I've worked with <laughs> was one thing. But then I thought of people like Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel, for example, who started to train in his predecessor before he finished. He then retired early and then he let go of the business. And what her question was, was really, how did, how were they motivated? Why were they motivated to do that? And I thought about that great quote that society becomes great when people plant trees under which shade they'll never, ever sit. I love that quote. But then on the way home on the flight, I was reading more about your book, more into your book. And I read about Becton Dickinson and Ed Ludwig and how he paved the way for his COO for Lenza. And you say he wanted to designate a strong successor and a company capable of innovating and growing more successfully. So I thought I'd pass that question on to you and perhaps then I'll send her this answer and I'll go, Mike Beer did a much better on version of answering that question than I ever could. So maybe you have that to share and then we'll get stuck into the framework. So basically the question is, why, why would Ed Ludwig be motivated to invest in his company. Well, first of all, Ed Ludwig was an accountant by training, not naturally trained for management, but he was in a, he joined Becton Dickinson because it already had some history of concern for the customer and a long, more long-term kind of vision. He told me that one of the things that motivated him was coming down the hallway on the way to the CEO's office and the other offices of key executives, which he passed every day. And he said, all the way, there was a gallery of two or three. There weren't many previous CEOs, the owners, and then a couple of other CEOs. And they were there, the pictures were there. And he said, every time he passed them, he said, Oh my God, I better not screw up. And what he meant by that was that there was a history to the company that he particularly valued. Now, I would also say that he was motivated partly by his religion, which was Catholic, but a Jesuit. He went to Holy Cross, which is a Jesuit school. And the Jesuits believe in doing good. So the notion of doing good, the history of the company, the pictures up there were all part of who he was. And so I would argue that CEOs are willing to invest either from inside some values as Ed Ludwig did based on his Jesuit background and training at, at Holy Cross and partly if it's there by the culture, but there's a third element. They have, they must have an ambition, an ambition to create a good and great company. That ambition is universal. If you don't have it, you don't make any changes at all. Uh, you need to think about what we call a higher ambition to leave something, to leave a legacy, to, to do not just well this quarter, but to do well in the long run. If you don't have that perspective, I'm sorry to say to that woman, those CEOs who she referred to who had no motivation, and if the board was a good board, they would have to themselves 
have some longer term game as opposed to a quarter game. So the board also plays a role in this. View, Mike, view. I said to the lady, it really comes down to the individual. It's an individual thing, and therefore they need to be a good hire for the organization. They need to be hired right. That's a, a role of the yeah. board, ideally, unless the board. they inherit that type of CEO. So I'm wiping my brow here, kind of going, I got that one okay. I, I didn't articulate it as well as you. But I just wanted to, before we get stuck into the framework, further on there, when you talked about BD, that ch chapter is dedicated to that case study. The, rep the task force, and we'll, we'll talk for, about what task force are in a moment, they created a report about BD because they ran the SFP process. And what they found is the case nearly in every organization, even today, even in organizations who know that they need to be invested in the future to be able to survive in that future, but they're mostly short-term financially focused. And I quote here what you wrote, BD focused too much on short-term financial performance and on meeting budgets. This focus left insufficient slack in the system for the company to fully pursue yeah. innovation and it undercut long-term investment in products and business development said one interviewee 50% of my time is spent on budget and that again is something everywhere that workshop I ran yesterday those people said how do we actually survive the future when 98% of our time is invested in today right. which is actually decisions we made yesterday that's a huge challenge. Ed Ludwig and the history of the company was a long-term kind of vision, but you also have to get your systems in line with that. So you have to be thinking about how do we budget? How do we think about slack or investment capital, both for physical and organizational and human th things? So the investment often is in the physical, you know, a new plant, a new piece of equipment, new technology, AI, that's hot, but it's not always targeted for investment in the organization and its people. And that, that was not exactly well done at BD, even though their aspiration, the aspiration was higher than the way they set up the budgeting system. They hadn't thought it through. But that's okay. That often happens. You have an aspiration, but your your behavior or the organization mechanisms you've created are not in line with that. That's that's what happened there. I think their aspirations were right, and they particularly after they went through a discussion of what we need to do in the long term, that was what the task force said is your budgeting system, your whole financial system is too short term oriented. You are not allowing for those investments. So they changed that. And this is what we're going to talk about now. So how do you do that as an organization? So I have two diagrams here, Mike. I have one that I'm going to share on the screen, which is a high level version. And then there's one that we'll get into, which is a nine part process. So maybe we'll start with this overview of the SFP, the strategic fitness process over to you. One of the core problems in organizations, we knew when BD called and said, we'd like to be a company capable of executing our aspirations, basically our strategy. They didn't talk much about values at that time, but strategy. We knew already that most of the information about what might work is working and not working is blocked from the senior team. It's a called organizational silence. That's the term that academics and, and practitioners understand. It means that the organization or people in it are silent about things that matter. The second thing we wanted to do, or at least we had a notion we wanted to do, but we, this got clearer as we executed this process. We wanted to create a partnership, that's commitment, between the people in the organization and the senior team in the enterprise of creating a better organization. That is, if you don't have a partnership, if you don't have the trust and the commitment of lower levels to, to really get in and help make it happen, it is not going to happen 
in the long run. In the short run, you might get some changes, but it's not going to last. So <clears throat> the method here we created is one that gives people a voice. That is, it breaks silence. And it is a method and a process for creating a partnership. A partnership means that the top is as accountable to the organization as the people in the organization are accountable to senior management. So they deal with two inconvenient truths. The inconvenient truth that management has for its people, which may be tough goals, changes that may be hard to make <clears throat> because of the changes in a competitive environment. They know and understand better for the company as a whole than anyone else. And it's also inconvenient truths for them, which is some things are good and some things are just not working. Even you may not be working right in the right way. You may not be leading properly. So that's the notion, the ideas underlying that. And so we have to have honest conversation. We'll go deeper into the process next. Sure, and sure. I have a couple of just little quotes and anecdote here that I was picking my pin for the show today. And it yeah. looks like I got it right. It's a monkey covering its ears. So the idea of hear no evil. Yeah. You could also say speak no evil, where the organization yeah. doesn't pipe up because it doesn't have psychological safety to do so, or else leadership doesn't want to hear it. One thing before we get into the nine part process <clears throat> was I, I felt so much what you said, and I hadn't seen this written so well before, is that lack of accountability. Because very seldom our leadership held accountable for their actions or their strategic actions. It's easier to hold individuals who are specialists in their roles accountable for a failure, for example. But it's that lack of accountability. And in a large hierarchical organization, it's even harder to find that accountability. This is, again, something that came up yesterday, but often comes up in the workshops. Absolutely. Uh, all organizations are hierarchical. The fact that they are hierarchical insulates management from accountability to lower levels for doing whatever they need to do to make the organization more successful. They're not likely to hold themselves accountable any more than you and I are completely honest in holding ourselves accountable for whatever we promise somebody to do. That's what bosses are for. They hold us accountable. That's the hierarchy. <clears throat> but there's no reversal of that accountability. And unless there is a reversal or, or a two-way accountability is really not a reversal. It's both are accountable to each other. You don't have a partnership. Now think about any relationship you have with your peers. It doesn't just account. If you want a relationship, of, if you promise something in your department to do for another department so they can get on with the process of whatever might product development or whatever it might be, and you don't live up to those expectations, you don't live up to your promise, what's going to happen? They're going to be very upset and they're going to begin to distrust you and your department for delivering what you promised. And, and the same thing is true vertically, but vertically, it's easier for you to call your other, call the other department that for them to call you on your lack of accountability, it's very hard to lower levels to say to the CEO and the senior team, you promised and you didn't do. In the, and by the way, individuals can do that one-on-one -on -one sometimes, but it doesn't change the nature of the relationship in a public sense, in a collective sense. So the organization, this is a co an honest collective and public conversation. The three elements are honesty, which we created into the process. Collective means that you're having a conversation not between one on one, but the senior team is having a conversation with the organization as a whole. They announce the process. They know that there's a task force representing them, that they meet some of those members directly, that will be working with senior management on behalf of the voice that they are giving to the task force, telling them what's working and what's not. Public, 
in the sense that the management is creating accountability and trust by saying, this is what we heard, and this is what we're planning to do, and we want to re- keep this conversation going so that you can tell us, and if you know we did it, that by itself is a powerful message and very trust-creating and commitment creating. But we want to also know when we are not living up to something we said we would do as a result of the feedback that you gave. And I think I've mentioned to you, maybe in our last conversation, that when Ed Ludwig did this process as a division manager, which is why he took it to the corporate level when he was a CEO, it was so successful and so powerful, he simply announced to the organization what he was going to do. Before he even did it, they were saying, oh my God, they get it. They were just motivated by the idea that they would be able to tell Ludwig and his team what was wrong. And there were some things in his division that were absolutely not working and frustrating the hell out of people and their effort to compete. So those are the the ideas, trust, partnership and commitment and accountability, both ways. And one of the things you say, Mike, in the book is that time after time, the leaders you worked with that implemented SFP and showed vulnerability in their own process, who got coaching, who accepted the feedback, who weren't defensive. As a result, they grew in the eyes of the people they were serving. And they also had that idea of being a servant leader. And I thought that was an important one because many people are afraid to let take off the mask that we talked about in part one, because they're afraid that they'll be seen as weak. And in some organizations they are, but that's a question of Have you got the right board? Oh, vulnerability is the basis of creating trust. There are many psychological studies that show basically that when one individual makes themselves accountable to others, is open and makes himself accountable to do something, that vulnerability, that openness about themselves or that process of asking for help from your employees that you will want to hear the honest truth, that starts the process. Then if the people in the organization reciprocate with providing honest conversations and then reciprocate, again, it's an iterative process. When management says, this is what we want to do, we need you to be involved in this and to be committed to it. That, again, keeps that reciprocal process going. You trust lower levels, they act, you trust them more. You are honest with them and they don't go away saying, we got an ineffective CEO uh, or general manager. This goes against what most managers assume gives them strength, which they think they need to have, and they do. That is legitimacy to say to somebody, would you do this? That legitimacy does not come from being strong and silent and decisive. It comes from the, you're stronger when you're opening up about yourself and have that honesty and secure in your ability to talk about those things in a non-defensive way. All of this we kind of knew, but boy, it became obvious as a result of working with companies on this process, using this process. You could just see all that happening immediately at the Santa Rosa Systems Division. People said, we couldn't talk about any of the problems. One of the members of the senior team said, we're like a dysfunctional couple. We have problems, but we don't talk about them. This process opened it up and it created a stronger general manager. They had criticisms of the general manager, Scott Wright. It's in the book. And just the process itself made him stronger. What is it that makes a leader strong? Lynn Camp, another general manager we worked with, and in fact, I worked with her personally, learned that quickly, that the more open she was, the stronger she got as a leader. And she, by the way, also mentions that even in a company as strong in culture as Hewlett Packard, she had never heard a manager open up about their mistakes directly and openly. 
what I told her to do and her feedback about what they were going to do to the organization after we went through the process, and we'll go through the process in a minute. I said to her, why don't you tell them what you heard personally about your leadership? Because there was feedback about her leadership. That was one of the problems. She said, as soon as I did this, people told me later, my God, if she was open about herself, she heard everything that we had to say about the way the organization is not functioning. And that changed the whole dynamic. It made her stronger as a leader. And she began to realize that that kind of openness doesn't make her weaker. It makes her stronger. And that is a very counter, we call this a counterintuitive process and unconventional because it's not used by everyone, but it is a very powerful thing when it works right, as it did for Lynn Camp, as it did for Ed Ludwig. And the fact, Mike, they were willing to also have their names in the book, I, I thought that was a huge compliment yeah. to them, that they were willing to put warts and all the entire experience in the book. Because there's, that's one of the other things, is that the victors write history, and it's like we've been victorious, so therefore best foot forward stuff, but like you want to show warts and all. That creates authenticity, that creates leadership, that creates followership. Uh, one of the things that I thought about that was on an individual level, anybody who's received executive coaching, anybody who is an executive coach, anybody who has evolved as a person, you only evolve when you get the warts and all feedback and you actually accept it and you actually work on it. It, it doesn't feel great. I mean, that's the other thing. It, it, yeah. it, who wants to be criticized? But yeah. it's only well, when Ed you Ludwig actually... didn't want to be criticized either. And he was up all night after he got the feedback. Yeah. But he was, but he accepted it and worked with it and got stronger in the eyes of the organization. Yeah. And and your friend, Mike Tushman, he, he said that to me as well, the, the leaders that he covered in case studies, for example, Philip CEO, that organizational renewal is only successful when there's personal renewal from the leadership team in, in alignment. Absolutely. Those two things have to go together. You can't, you can't delegate this idea to HR and they do the process. No, because it doesn't include the leader and the leadership team. They're the ones who have to show that vulnerability have to show that readiness to hear the truth, ready to talk back and tell them what they heard honestly. You know, I didn't just hear all the good things. Here's a couple of four, three, or whatever number is of things that I heard about the organization and ourselves as not being completely right. Needs change, needs adjustment. And that's how they are able to do that. And by the way, I'll say this, this is really a conclusion, but I'll say it now before we get through the process. This turns out to be both an organization development process, that it changes the system because you hear about a, you know, a lot of things that lead to organi reorganizing and so forth as, I'll, as we can talk, but it also is a leadership development process. Lynn Camp said this changed her forever as a manager. That is, she already was a pretty good manager. It wasn't that she was horrible. It wasn't that she didn't belong in the general general management, senior general management cadre, but she didn't really know everything she needed to know about leading, particularly leading in that situation. It made her a stronger leader, and she said, it, it, and not, not just what she did, but the process itself of vulnerability, action, accountability made her, she began to understand those things, as did Ed Ludwig. It wasn't that he wasn't naturally, more. He, as I said, for reasons I already discussed, he was inclined that way, but he didn't fully understand the process. Now he's off telling everybody to use this process. Not everybody is accepting it, but he's, he's, he's selling it because he believes in it. Yeah, and one of the things I unfortunately see, and I'm sure you do, and I'm sure everybody who works in corporate change sees, is that there's often get the rest of the organization to do it. I, but I'm above it. I don't have to get changed as well. You see that a bit, unfortunately, when it comes to oh corporate change. Well, I wrote an article about this in HBR. 
with the basic theme of the great training robbery. What CEOs do is they want to change the organization. So they call HR and HR is complicit with them. It's a kind of, they know they got to do something when the CEO says, and they don't, and they don't even know better than to speak up. Go run this training program on these kinds of things. So that's what we call in the, in, in the, in our book on corporate renewal, the programmatic approach to change. Go run a program, get people to tell them, you know, and lecture them and discuss them and present all kinds of information. But that is what I call the great training robbery. We spend billions on training. I can cite the numbers. I wrote an article and got them. Um, and basically, they're more or less have no effect at all. Two little notes I've taken here that I, I'll have to come to you. You mentioned the ugly truth, for example, in BD. We may as well share them and then we can focus on the, on the SFP framework. So you mentioned, Mike, some of the ugly truths that came through when they did the process in BD. Maybe we'll start with that. Sure. The ugly truth, there were many. There were about, I think, about eight or I forget the exact number of items that the task force talked about when they came back and told senior management, these are what's hindering our organization. These are the, are the barriers to moving ahead. They talked a lot about the good stuff. We have ethical ground rules. We do the right thing. We try to do the right thing. We try to work correctly and honestly with the customer and so forth. But here are the things that are barriers and you need to look at them. Well, one of the most ugly truths was that Ed Ludwig, as the chief financial officer, had been in charge of a new enterprise system. And he delegated that to someone. And the thing was kind of off track without going into a lot of detail. People thought it wasn't working well. This was never going to succeed. And Ed didn't know this. So they came back and said, this thing is way off the track. And the task force and he, he, first of all, looked at it and said, oh, my God, to get this on the track, we're going to spend another hundred million dollars and we don't have any, we haven't budgeted. Well, the first thing he did was he accepted that as a perceptions of fact. That's one of the things we try to tell the, C, the CEO and the leadership team. Because one of the first things that happened when we did this, before we understood all this, the general manager said, that's not true. Well, <laughs> what do you mean it's not true? Most people, a good sample of the organization, sees this as a problem. And he accepted the fact and, and went home at night, did not had a sleepless night by his own account, and decided, well, I'm going to have to reappoint somebody to run this thing correctly. But I'm going to have to go to the board and ask for hundred million dollars. I'm a new CEO. He did this within a, a month or two of taking charge. This was his way. He understood this as a fundamental way to begin to get started in a new era of his leadership. And he went to the board and asked for hundred million dollars, explained the whole problem. And they said, yes. You go ahead and spend a hundred million. It's going to throw us off the budget, off what we told the shareholders, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a, a very ugly truth that he had to accept. Another ugly truth that didn't have as much to do with him, although he's every CEO's embedded everything. The company had a habit of loading all or the orders onto the last last quarter because that was a way of showing the earnings that they wanted to have for the year because they had promised something to wall street first of all it was running havoc with their supply chain so there were all kinds of technical and other problems resulting from that kind of practice it was unethical in the sense that it was deceiving the shareholder in fact it was not illegal at the time but Within a year or two, a, a pharmaceutical company violated the law and they were held accountable for billions of dollars for that violation of 
of the rules that became a rule that you couldn't do that because in the governance process, you want to be honest with the shareholder. Well, they took hold of this and they changed it. And that itself caused a lot of reverberations, more money spent, more reorientation of how they were going to run the business. They didn't know that at the senior team, each of these problems was not discussed. It was hidden by organization silence. So nobody dealt with it. What am I going to do? Go up to Ed Ludwig and tell him that the enterprise system is wrong? Even if I did, by the way, even if someone had the courage to do it, it would not change a thing. Because the CEO, first of all, doesn't understand whether this is a complainer, somebody who always has a better way to do it, or whether this is valid data that represents the truth. That's one of the purposes of the process, is to create a set of data that is indisputable for its validity, and that is because it involves, through a task force, which we'll get to in a minute, the whole or significant part of the organization, anywhere between 100 and 150 people who are interviewed by the task force. And that voice is a voice spread across the whole organization. It isn't one person. My God, the majority of the 100 we interviewed, or the 150 in Beckton Dickinson's case, you know, the majority thought this was something, you know, that came out as a strong theme in the analysis of the task force because they have to analyze their data and make sure that they identify themes that are supported by a majority of the people they talk to, not by one or two or three in one part of the organization, across the whole organization, the marketing part the manufacturing part or the operations part, whatever it might be. Amen, Mike. And it's so, so difficult. I've been that soldier. Many of our audience have where you think, oh, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to say it. I've got the ear of the CEO here. And really, you're digging your own grave. You have gone around executives. Then they all start to turn on you and they ostracize you. And you have to leave the organization as a result. That's why the senior team is accountable for this process. They have to lead it as a team because they all have to buy in. And that's the problem with the CEO. Even if the CEO believes the person who is bringing the bad news, how is he going to convince the rest of the organization that this is a valid point? Oh, no, we know that guy. He always complains. Oh, no. Again, I'm contrasting an individual going to the CEO and even the CEO, let's say the CEO believes what that person says. You know, I've been worried about that. You're right. How does he convince the senior team that it's right? Because some other member of the senior team might say, no, I don't think that's right because of some other things they know or think is true. So they all need to hear the voice of the organization. And that is very powerful. Literally, una voce. It's everybody singing from the same hymn sheet. I'll be killed if we don't cover one last thing before the framework. We'll be okay. finished again, Mike. We'll be doing 20 episodes by the time we finish. The great training robbery. I, I actually found that article again. It was it was your friend, Jim Dieter, <laughs> who told me about it. But in it, you mentioned there's an organization, Cardo, which is a Swedish industrial co conglomerate. And that's one of the case studies you cover of an organization who had done things badly. Maybe we'll just mention that because you, you touched on it. Cardo is a good example. They tried all kinds of training and programmatic approaches, but when they started using this process with one of my colleagues in Two Point, Sweden, and there were some examples of where that was happening, that is, they adopted the process and its underlying principles, and it has the effect and others that didn't do that and didn't make as much strategic progress as I recall that particular example. But there was another company in the UK that senior management wanted to improve management effectiveness. They didn't think managers were as effective or good as they needed to be. So they went to HR and said, we want to have a management development program. Well, about that time, somebody from BD came, had been hired to be on a senior team and he said no don't go that way let's use mike's process the strategic fitness process and when they did that they discovered all the real reasons 
why managers were not being developed. For example, the company was siloed completely so that one division or another division or one function or another function, if somebody needed someone, they would send people they really would not miss, not the best. And so people did not get the movement across functions and disciplines that you, they, you need to develop. That is completely consistent with a fundamental study that was done by the Center for Creative Leadership in North Carolina, published 25, 30 years ago, that basically said training is about 20% of the problem. Any programmatic approach is 20% developmental, 80% is giving people experiences across the activity. So that company, Cardo, did not have a systematic approach of moving people and planning for people's move, high potential managers to get moved across all the disciplines. And I had an insight from a Honeywell manager who said, you know, what we've discovered is that people move across, they want to use their technical and knowledge and their disciplinary knowledge to, to really run the place. Tom McAvoy, who we talked about yesterday in the electronic products division at Corning, sitting in new product development meeting, was talking about the technical elements. But that's not what really was important. It's important to be a, have a general management orientation that integrates, gets integration of the activities to get the product developed. And that was missing in this particular company in the UK because people didn't transfer people across and, and they didn't have a systematic process for deciding who and what part of the company would get moved to where to create their capability as a general manager. And BD itself also, that was another barrier uh, that they had to overcome. They didn't have a very good developmental effort uh, that developed every managers and leaders to be leaders and effective managers. I was traveling back from that workshop in London yesterday and I had to get an underground train, then the Heathrow Express. Right At one stage I was like going, oh, the Heathrow Express, they're going to have to wait 15 minutes for it, but it only takes 20 minutes. And I was like going, I could be on a train and I could be feeling I'm making progress, but it's going to take like an hour. I think in metaphor, like I said to you the last day, and I was reading your book while on the train, and I was going, well, that's actually what a lot of people who are in roles, say, for example, in HR or L&D, they invest in programs because it feels like progress. And the problem is the progress is not part of a systemic change. Right, and I thought right. it, it just becomes like a game of whack-a-mole. It's like going, yeah, but I've done something. I've done something. I've done something. And there's a quote from your book where you say about this systemic change. When leaders change just one facet of the organization without changing the others to reinforce it, the change won't <clears> last, <throat> if it even occurs at all. Honest conversations lay a foundation for systemic transformation because the partnership it creates enables senior leaders to change how the whole place is organized. Yeah, the organization is a, what I call a social system and there are multiple facets. And at BD, that was very obvious. The global leaders were also US managers. Their perspective was wrong. The structure was wrong. The planning process made the regions outside the US didn't give any voice. They got the plan. They were not part of creating it. To make them more innovative, they had to bring people in all the regions in with their thoughts about innovation, what they needed, and change the region structure so that U.S. was not part of the globe. So there was structural change. There was planning change. There was individual change in terms of the global leaders and what they would do. I can go on through this very quickly. Yeah. And I'll go back to the major points of what it's trying to accomplish. We had to design the process to create a partnership between the senior team and the organization. We understood this, but we, it, we began to understand it better as we went along. So the process starts with the senior team. <clears throat> you can't talk about alignment, 
fitting the process, fitting the company to the strategy or the values, aligning. That's the title of the book, Fit to Compete, which is the overall objective of this process. Let's change the system to enable implementation of desired strategic goals and desired values and cultural objectives. So the senior team has to start. What is our strategy? You can't align yourself with anything unless you start with a clear understanding of the strategy committed to by the whole senior team. One of the problems we saw immediately, and I'll talk about this next time when we talk about the silent killers, most strategies are not created by the whole senior team. And they're not created simply. There are large green, yellow, and black folders that represent the complete market analysis, et cetera. It's not understandable to people. So you need, we said, let's start with the senior team. And that's how this process, first of all, the CEO has to have a conversation about what this process is about. And they have to be able to say, this is our problem. This is the goal. goals are not what our problems or in detail are, but this is what we're trying to achieve. And we're not getting there. We have to get there. And two, to understand that this is what the process is, that they're going to hear the absolute unvarnished truth, as we call it, uh, about the organization. It's likely to include them and the senior team by direct mention or indirectly. So that is, they're accountable for the organization. So they start with a day. We usually allocate a day. If an organization has a lot done a lot of strategic work as BD had done, getting this into a two page statement, maximum three, not more than that, that they can share with the organization as this process unfolds. And that is, it states what the strategic goal, what is our strategy? What are we trying to do? We're trying to innovate. We're trying to get be cost effective. What What is it that really matters here? We're trying to serve the customer in a particular way. Whatever matters, really matters. This is a conversation about things that matter. This is the stuff that you're trying to do. So that is in, in, in the, the strategies in there. These are our values and how we want the organization to behave, the people to behave, groups to behave, you know, things about dignity and trust. They're all the same, mostly overlap a lot across organizations. And, and also the things, if they can, sometimes this emerges later, what does the organization have to do to achieve those strategic goals? Well, we need a lot of collaboration between marketing, R&D, and manufacturing because our goal is to increase the rate of product development. Or we need particular coordination and, and, and work, work a collaboration between IT technology and somebody, something else in the organization. It, it varies from what are the tasks? I call these strategic tasks. If they have them, if they understand them, sometimes this comes out of the process, but certainly strategy and, 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 and values. And the senior team that comes prepared to discuss this as well as they nominate two people in their organization who could possibly, who, who they would recommend be on the task force that they have to appoint. I will get into this in a minute. Because this process, if you have that first, maybe it would help if you started with that other chart, the, the advocacy and inquiry. This process is about involves the leadership team, it involves a task force, and the broader organization. The leadership team, it's an iterative process of advocacy and inquiry. I advocate the direction. This is what the leadership team works to do. And we appoint a task force to go out and interview a hundred people in the organization. Some organization, some companies want to do more than that, but a minimum of about a hundred in a smaller organization, it would be a smaller number. 
we do this in a restaurant, it, everybody who, there were 60 people, 70, 80 people, everyone was interviewed. But here it's a representative sample of the organization. The task force's job role is critical. They are taking the direction that the senior team develops, as I just saw it in a, the first day of the process, is the senior team meeting and developing, and they give it to the task force. And the task force then goes out, and of course the senior team says, we want you to get the truth. That's important. Then the task force goes out and interviews, and that about the direction. They give that two-page, three-page direction in advance to the member they're going to the person they're going to interview. I said a hundred, there may be eight people on the task force, and those eight divide, they decide who to interview. Senior management does not. Senior management can say, we'd like you to include people from Europe, from this, all that, but they don't know who it is and they don't identify the individuals. The task force does. Then they split up. Each of them does 10 or 12 interviews, depending on the exact number that they choose to interview. And they split up the task and they go out and interview those people with the direction. So that you can go back to that other chart if you want. And then and then they report that up top. And then it iterates back to inquiry because the senior team has to say, this is what we're going to do. This is what we heard what we're going to do. Back to inquiry. Let's find out what people think about this. What particularly at that. So the senior team defines a direction. They appoint. They come with two people who are going to be members of the task force. They're told that in advance that they understand the process at this point. And uh, then they have to discuss who the members are because any single member of the senior team can veto somebody who they think is a, a complainer, somebody who's always doing He's not objective about the process. That happens mm -hmm. very rarely, very rarely. Mike, can I just add as well, one thing that I thought was really important is that there's a reluctance to put your best people on this because your best people are usually the busiest people. Yes, absolutely. That's what we hear from everybody. We can't do this out there. You know, we got to do something else. No, you got to choose your best people. Now, there may be only eight, which is what we want on a task force, or there may be fewer, but you you got to choose the best people. And those people then, who you you empower them, you invest them with the direction. The CEO or the general manager of a division meets with the task force representing the, the senior team and tells them this is our direction, explains it so they understand what the direction is. That direction then is is what is in the task force members then meet they themselves have to get trained. That's step two. We call that task force training. They meet and they do as, as a lot of different things, but mainly two things. One is select a sample of 100 that they think are the key people in the organization who have wisdom and know what is really happening in their part of the organization or as a whole. And and then they also are told a little bit there there's an hour lecture or something on interviewing. And we have a particular interview method that's important. We call it the fire hose interview. Fire hose means you only ask, the, there are only three questions that you're asking and you let the individual talk. Whatever they want to say in response to that question they can say, and you then, you have to obviously take your notes and distill it later. The question, three questions are, this is a direction they, they've already given the person a direction by email or something, or they hand it to them. What's your evaluation of this direction? Are you okay with it? Or do you have to, you, do you see flaws in it? And that this, and then they'll just talk. The second question is, what are the strengths this organization has to leverage in achieving this direction we've just explained to you or gave you a copy of? And three, what do you see as the barriers to achieving that direction? Those are the three questions. And the individual just talks. 
Now there can be a few follow-up questions just to get the person to talk more. They, we use, we train them in paraphrasing so that they understand they can feed back to the person what they thought they heard. Is that about right or not? But they, but this is not a survey. This is very important. It is not an attitude survey. It's not check the, the box to tell me or tell me how much of this is happening. It's completely open for a reason. The complexity of the system though, do not come out if you give them a survey. Survey is usually about how do you feel? How are things going? What do you think of your leader? But it doesn't allow real understanding of what Beckton Dickinson, what Lynn Camp at S SGDU and others learn about the organization and how it works and di the dynamics of the organization. That's all about the things that make it work, the structure, the processes, et cetera, et cetera. That comes out of this discussion. This, the, uh, they task force then goes out to interview. The interviews were intended originally to last an hour. <clears throat> we found that there were many interviews that went well beyond the hour. People got, oh my God, this is my chance to get out what I've been thinking, whatever it might be. It might be about the strategy. It might be about the organization. It might be about how good I feel about this organization. This is their chance. And so they keep talking. In some organizations, people where the task force is known, they arrive at a particular manufacturing plant or location, whatever it might be, and and they're in a if they do it in person, they're in a conference room. People line up to talk to them. They want to say something too. So there is energy that's released by this process. Because people are for the first time saying, oh my God, this is an opportunity to get senior management to get it. By the way, as an aside, most people in organizations do not think their organization is capable of fundamental change. Uh, and this says, oh my God, maybe we are, because they've been through one program or another and they disappear over time. So the task force then does the interviews, they come back for a day to analyze their data. <clears throat> They're told in advance uh, what they need to do with their own interviews, which is to look across all 10 or 12 interviews and, I and basically at the end of each interview, write down what are the three strengths I heard, if there were any, up to three, and what are the three barriers I heard. Maybe they maybe only got two, but if they're more than, they can't do more than three. It gets too complicated. Then they meet together, and that is step four. Okay, we've been through three steps. Step four is the meet, the one day meeting could be longer if needed, but we found one day works. The task force comes together and goes through a process, what we call, it's in a, what's called an alignment affinity process. They Somebody starts by putting up the, uh, the three strengths they had and the three barriers they had. Then the second person comes up with post-its. Okay, I see mine over here, so let me put it in this clump. And I see another one I really got, maybe in different words, but here's a whole new one. They add that as a different, in a different row, a different column. And so you get columns of the key things that people heard. There are a few outliers sometimes that there's no majority on, but that's how you consolidate into what we call themes. Those are the themes <clears throat> the task force will feed back to senior management. And in that day, step four, they rehearse, they, I might add, by the way, in step two, when they're trained, they interview each other. That's a way in which they learn, they can examine how well they interview, whether they, but that now we're in step four. They then consolidate the data and they rehearse what we call a fishbowl discussion. This is step five in the process. The senior team is sitting on the outside Task force in a around a table in the middle. The ground rules before we start the, the the facilitator. There is a facilitator for this process. 
discusses the ground rules. The ground rules are the senior team is listening. They are not speaking. They are not interrupting, except at the end of each theme when they can ask questions, but they can't say what anything else. They can't say you guys are, and perceptions are fact. That is what they hear has to be accepted as a fact because it's what 100 to 150 people said to the task force, the task force appointed by you for being good, good people and effective people are representing to you what the organization said. The task force, then one of the things the task force does is it, it lists all the major barriers, somewhere between five and eight or nine key barriers that typically arise and key strengths. They list those things on a flip chart or somewhere so it can be seen. And they say, we're gonna start talking about these things in more detail. And the task force is under ground rules of not mentioning who said it or blaming the senior team for what the problem is. It's not blaming the leaders for it. It's what they heard the problem is so that the causes can be sorted out later. And that's basically the conversation. Then you start the conversation. Each individual has a responsibility for leading the conversation about what they heard about barrier one. Our organization is whatever. And they begin to talk about what they heard and then go to others and say, what did you hear? We're now in step five, task force feedback. What did you hear on this theme? And what did you hear? Or you, you interviewed in Europe. What did they have to say about this? Or, but not who, just that they interviewed there and there's some people there said these things. Or I interviewed over here in this activity and this is what they had to say. Never mentioning a department where only one person is present. And they, you wanna hide, you wanna be sure to maintain confidentiality. That is the ground rule. We're talking about the issues, not about the people. And the task force then begins to go through this process. And the, the fishbowl can last, in one company, it lasted six hours because it was a pretty dysfunctional organization. And they, in talking about each theme, they talk about, and we ask that they interview to get this information, not only what they felt like and what people said, give us examples. They provide examples of what they're talking about. So we've had problems with new product development. Just let me tell you what happened to product X. This is what we heard happen down below in the organization, how it got screwed up or whatever it might be. Or if it's a strength, this is what exactly our strength is. So we have great values. This is how they've played out to help us as an organization. They start, by the way, with the feedback about the strengths. That's where they start. And then they go talking about what they heard about the strategy, what they heard were the barriers in the organization, and what they heard. Um, so that discussion can go on, but usually it's anywhere from three to four hours of discussion to get everybody to, in the task force to talk about what they heard, the examples and so forth. Senior team can ask a question at the end of each of these themes. So we talked about our leader, or we talked about the senior team, which often gets mentioned as a major problem. This is what we heard. Now the senior team can ask questions, but they can't say, where did you get this? Who told you this? Or it's not true. Those are basically the ground rules and the facilitator has to interrupt and keep it on there. Although it usually is no problem. Once they understand the, the ground rules, they keep to them pretty well. Then the, t the task force leads. By the way, this process can take, can be done in about six to eight weeks, nine weeks at the most in a global organization. So this is not a drawn out process. We gotta get these, this thing going because we gotta get moving and making changes. So the task force then 
this goes away. And the senior team then meets for, typically we urge day one is a feedback, day two, they meet to discuss and diagnose the data, the, the question, the task, the, this is step six. The senior team meeting alone, diag says, what did we hear? Do we all agree we heard these things? Two, why do we think we have these problems? What are the underlying causes? And we urge the task for the senior team to use what in the quality movement are the five whys. Why are we hearing this? Why do you think that is the issue? Let's ask another why. Another why and why. As many as you can down the ladder of inference, you can go to really figure out what's really going on here. Maybe it's our assumptions, maybe whatever. So that is what happens in that meeting. And from that, they create their diagnosis. This is what we think and their action plan. That's on day day three, although two and three are mixed up. You get a diagnosis, you begin to talk about action, you do another, go through another round of diagnosis. You t but at the end of this, they have to come up with an action plan. In step seven, the senior team has to, is, is the senior team has created an action plan. They know what they heard. They agreed on the themes, they, they on the issues and the action plan, they meet with the task force. And they ask the task force, this is one day, they start by representing, telling them what they thought they heard and what they're planning to do. The task force goes away without the senior team for something like two, three, four hours if necessary to say, what do you think the senior team heard it, got it right? What is, what is our evaluation of the action plan? Is it, is it doable? Does it make sense given what we already said to the senior team in our feedback? And they come back to the senior team with what their critique is of their action plan. You didn't hear this and we didn't hear that anything, any, in any of the, what you told us you, you heard, or we don't think this is going to work. So in one company, it just as an example, but it often happens, they came back to Scott Wright and SRSD, but this happened to be a UK company. They came back and said, you left, we told you, take out a layer of management and we do not, and for reasons we gave you. We don't see that, you don't address that problem in the action plan. So either you don't think it's right or you have, but there's no, so further discussion. The task, the senior team and the task force have to come to an agreement about what the action, correct action plan is before it goes, the process goes further. They have to be in agreement. This is what we heard and this is what, what the action plan is that we as a senior team and task force are committed to. This is really what we believe is, is we'll begin to fix the problem of our organization. So. Then the step, that's step seven, the critique that can happen in one day, basically. Senior team makes a, an hour or two hour presentation. They go away for three or four. Sometimes if there's vast disagreement, as there was as SRSD, the general manager couldn't get agreement from, from the task force. He said, let's break up into subgroups. Let's go back and discuss exactly why we have where the problem lies and what, what the action plan should be. And ultimately, they all came to the same understanding and, and they, they could move on. Then we move to a step of implementation. The implementation goes through several phases. First, the task force, the senior management, often and usually with the ta talk to the top, the extended leadership team, the top all the top 100 who were interviewed, the key people who were interviewed, they don't have to be top, they're, they're below in the middle or, or wherever they are. And others, if they think, if they weren't interviewed, not everyone can get interviewed. They're brought, if they're senior and they're key people in across the, they're in this meeting and the senior manager tells them, CEO or general manager, 
announces, well, this is what we heard. This is our action plan. And they break up into three small groups or four or five small groups to discuss it and come back with any further thoughts or concerns about the action plan. This is mobilizing the organization for action. The action plan usually includes, we urge, involvement of the task force and others in various task forces to begin to work on the problem. So the, the plan has to be a, a plan in a change in organizing, managing, and leading that we think are central to what we heard. If, if, if organization, how we organize is a problem, we have to announce what the new organization will be. If it's management, the barriers and management process like planning and accountability and, and goals that are being set, that has to be in, in the action plan as well. And if there are things about the senior team and the leader, that has to be in the action plan. What do we plan to do to try to change the way we are working? We're obviously going to have to do some things offline to, to work on this, but here is what we're planning to do. So that is a conversation. We've heard from groups that we studied who've been through this process that this was a a, a very powerful process because it they were absolutely began to change their view of senior management. Our CEO, I'm thinking about one particular company, got up and told us what he heard and what he's planning to do. Oh my God, he told us the truth. Things that he didn't want to hear about himself or the senior team or the organization. And he revealed all of them. Some, In some cases, we recommend the task force go through the feedback directly and tell this is what we told, you know, a shorter version of what we told senior management. The general manager then has to acknowledge, yes, this is what we heard. And this is what we're going to do. So they come back and said, I think our leaders have, they, they are more courageous than I thought they were. And the, the perception that they are courageous is a powerfully important kind of emotional change in how people feel about the leaders and the organization. Now they're probably saying this organization can change. This is real. We're, we're working on something real. This isn't going to be a, a program that disappears, a fad of the day. This is going to be fundamental. The last step is two things. One is nine is going out and beginning to sort out. So if a task force is assigned to rethink the planning process and come back to management with what they think the planning process should be to include more regional representation, what does what that process look like? They work the details out. There was any action plan in general, but they work the details. This is how the process will go starting on day one of the process, et cetera, et cetera. They run that by the senior management. The senior management agrees uh, or their changes, and they that then they go on and implement that change and so forth. And uh, Institutionalization, step nine, is that the senior team periodically goes through the same process. So at the end of six months or a year, usually a year, but it could be shorter depending on the rapidity of, of what needs to happen, they go to the task force. They, well, first of all, they commit to meeting with the task force informally two or three or four or five times. That happened at BD. It happened at the Santa Rosa to just meet with them. How do you think it's going? What are you hearing from the organization? What are you seeing working? What don't you see working? But then there's a formal reiteration of this process with the question, are we making progress against the problems that we identified in round one? At the Santa Rosa Systems Division, the general manager after this, he said, talk to the senior team, can we agree that we should do this process annually as part of the strategic plan. So we do it, we define the strategic plan, we get approval from the senior team, we create a task force to say, what are the strengths and barriers 
to basically implementing this strategic plan. So it's a rolling three-year plan. So we now got a new plan for the three years forward. And we get another one the following year. They did this for five years in a row until there was a major reorganization and this organization was no longer in existence. And it was, as the ARHR person said, who by the way was an integral part of the process because she was in a discussion, she was where with the senior team, when the senior team violated the ground rules, that's a whole nother set of ground rules that we created, that they created for themselves with our advice about how to get the conversation moving and limited in time. They had a problem in creating consensus. So she, because they go on and on and on. So the process we all agreed to with our recommendation, but they discussed it and agreed to it, is the general manager, Scott Wright, announces the problem. We agree on the time frame. It's going to be a year. Or it's going. To, I mean, it's going to be a, an hour or it's going to be two hours to discuss this. At the end of that time, if we have no consensus, Scott Wright decides. He's the general manager. But he comes back to the group with his decision, and we get a chance to have a shorter discussion. Do we agree with it or are we going to veto that discussion? That, that we think it needs to be improved. And then use, and that's that's it. Well, at the end of that, if there's no consensus about how it should be changed or improved, that is the action plan. And we're committing to going out and speaking with one voice about this. This is one of the barriers that we, we talk about, one of the seven silent killers, is a senior team is not an effective team because they go out and talk about, oh, well, they said this, but we're going to do this. This is our plan. No, no, it's got to be consistent with what you agreed to as a senior team. So nine is a reiteration. Re, so this is an iterative process. It's advocacy, it's inquiry. Now it's advocacy of what we're going to do. Now it's inquiry with the task force and a larger organization. Do you agree with this? Then, then it is, let's, let's go do it. And let's hear what we, advocacy again about what we heard about progress. In inquiry that is inquiry and action. This is what we're going to do to change what we're doing. It's a constant advocacy and inquiry process, iterative. Nobody can take an action without inquiring. That it, it's a it's a both sides have to agree essentially on on what what's the what's the problem at this point and what do we need to do. One thing I want to say is that it is a structured process for a reason. It is very easy to make a mistake and leave something out. So a mistake is, let's, oh man, you guys are at fault for this. The re, no, blame, blaming is off. Defensiveness is out. Senior management can't say that's not true. Senior management cannot say, well, I don't agree with that. And basically, uh, you guys are off, way off. I don't think any of this is right. No, that's defensiveness. They have to be open to the feedback. They test the their understanding with and so on. So the structure is very important. And of course, it, the sequence is important. You start with strategy. You inquire about the barriers and the strength. You go listen. You create an action plan. You talk to the, then you, that's the inquiry part, action plan. This is what we think we heard and what we're going to do. Inquiry again. And on and on. So that. That's the structure is important because we want to make this process replicable. What we decided to do is not rely on something that required a consultant. It does require a facilitator, but it doesn't mean a high priced consultant from McKinsey or something else. It's just a facilitation process. And in most organ, then we urge that a human resource, the strategic folks in the human resource function, be trained and so they can be internal facilitators. They do not have to rely on outside consultants because that bill can go up. That's what happened at BD. They said, oh my God, this is going well, but we don't want to keep hiring you. So we said, we'll write a handbook and we'll train your HR people to do this, which we did. I love that the origin of the word coach, it comes from the word stage coach, which is to take people from point A to point B. And I think that's the job here of a consultant is actually to take them from point A to point B, but then right. actually let them 
run it themselves. I often think that the really good consultants start with a splash, but leave a ripple and the ripple to be really effective needs to be consistently happening. And it, then, you know, when you were explaining the idea of there's a constant moving back and forth between advocacy and in, inquiry, that that's almost like the tide coming in and coming out, that it has to be living. It has to be, it's not a swimming pool, it's actually the ocean. And, and that means it's perpetually moving and it's perpetually, and the organization's perpetually moving. So this process, once an organization has it, it's a muscle that they have, it's a skill set they have, and they must never end. I mean, it's never over. It's not an event, it's a mindset. Right, this is not, that's right, it's not an event, it's not a program, ideally. Now, I have to say that not every organization has said, we're going to do this a second, third, and fourth time, like the Santa Rosa. At, at BD, they did it also. Four different CEOs used the process as a way of starting their era, what we call an era, a strategic era. And then they asked a lot of divisions and various parts of the organization to go through the process. It wasn't complete or 100% but they began to see how they could institutionalize this process. That's what, that's what creates an adaptive organization. We're looking for, ad, you know, to, to be a quicker organization, to have agility. This is what creates agility. Agility is the ability to change with changing circumstance. And that requires an organizational learning process. This is not, just an individual learning process, which is what training does. It's an organizational learning process. When it goes well, it's very powerful, but you have to have a leader who is willing to do it and consistently follows through. And so a lot of it is contingent on the leader. Their willingness to do it, by the way, not everyone wants to do this. It's not a natural thing. It's But the people who do and do it well, really profit from it mike we, we could talk forever man i've taken loads of your time today i, I told you we'd need lots of time and we, by the way we're only on chapter two by the way and we've left out <laughs> the detail we've let lo lots of the detail out i think what so we're going to do for finale is it, it's going to be a nice segue for mike's next book which is talking about the silent killers those, those silent killers by the way have been in Mike's head for years. They go right back to that training robbery article. They're in that as well. The, the, the origins of them are in there. But then through your experience, Mike, you've obviously built on that. And what we'll cover is the chapter on it in the book tomorrow. And that'll leave us in a nice way to do another episode, perhaps in a year or so when that new book is out, please yeah. God. So Mike, where, where can people find you to find out more about Fit to Compete? Amazon carries just put in Mike Beer or Fit to Compete and it will come up and they can purchase it there. And do you, you have a website as well, don't you? Yes, I have a website, Beer, capital Beer, B-E-E-R, capital M, Michael.com. That is my website. And on it, you'll find, by the way, the over, chapter one of the book is in there as is the preface of the story of Tom McAvoy, which we discussed last time, and more information about the process and also about other ways in which I've talked about this in articles and blogs and a little bit more about me. And it's an invitation to anyone who wants to pick up the phone and say, gee, this is a very intriguing set of ideas can we spend 15 minutes or a half hour on the phone talking about it? Yes, you can do that free of charge. I want the organ people in, in the world of management to get it. That's my goal. It isn't to sell books. It's for them to do it. Uh, the book is a vehicle. And that's really, really clear, Mike. And, and I'm delighted to be able to bring this knowledge to more and more people. I hope that that's the case. I link to those websites as well in the show notes for people to find it. I'll link to the articles that we mentioned as well. And of course, I'll link to Amazon where you can find the book. It's been a, an honor talking to you in part two, and we're going to record part two, three tomorrow, Mike, as well. Author of Fit to Compete, Why Honest Conversations About Your Company's Capabilities Are the Key to a Winning Strategy. Michael Beer, thank you for joining us. 
Thank you very much, Aiden. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to all for listening.